promise on my honor to be a better leader every day. Faithful and loyal to my country, organization, and fellow team members, countrymen and women. I pledge myself to remain true to the core values of integrity and self-discipline through my daily choices and actions. My mind is alert, focused at all times. I shall show respect to everyone always and every time. I remain a better leader and team player always. So I pledge. Welcome back, Cherish viewers. This is Leadership 360, our weekly program that sends us into the realms of leadership, where we look at the critical rudiments of leadership and strategy change management issues for the betterment of our society. We've been on this journey for the past eight months. Today marks the end for 2023. And we are excited that you've been with us throughout the period. Today, we're going to have a very critical discussion on wealth creation and, if you like, management. To help us delve deeply into this topic, we have on set a consultant, a practitioner, who has been through it all. Though very young, he has achieved quite a lot. He is a chartered accountant and a financial economist, a former banker, an author, and a mentor to many young people regarding financial management and wealth creation. He is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Leadership and Governance, Ghana and USA. He is currently a lecturer at Apia Menka University of Science and Technology. He is also a Nelson Mandela Fellow at the Washington, with the Department of um, uh, the U.S. Department, Department of State. State. We are honored to have on set today Dr. Evans Dia. Doc. Thank you You're so much. Thank you so system. much, Dr. Elvi. Thank you In for fact, having me. In fact, I must admit that he's a bilingual. He's a French <laughs> scholar as well. So uh, this afternoon, maybe I will rehearse or practice some of my French. Bienvenue uh, sur Leadership Trust San Sensan. Oui, Trust San Sensan. Okay. So I've not forgotten my French. Yeah, good. Yeah, good enough. That's, 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 that's great. Good. So we're happy to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. How is Kumasi? Ah, Kumasi is a good place. Actually, Kumasi is home for me all the time. It's actually mm -hmm. the place I want to be almost all the time. Anyway, <laughs> so for this afternoon, we have stolen you away from yes, Kumasi. Yes, Kumasi. The whole Ghana is going to benefit from your insight that you share Thank with you us. Thank you for having me. So, um, we are live on mm -hmm. Metro TV Ghana um, at DSTV channel 277. Okay. And on Facebook Live at Metro TV Ghana. And also on VOL online radio. Uh, along the program, viewers will join us and with their contributions, their questions, and will clarify. Excellent. Just to set the ball rolling, you've been in the financial service sector, if I may put it that mm. way. Generally speaking, when we talk about wealth, what is it that we're talking about? So the good thing for I'll put it in simple perspective, is that for most people, wealth has different meanings. So it's not um, just a one-size-fits-all kind of definition. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for some people, wealth can be psychological. Okay. Some of them, it can be about social status. Some can be materialistic. Wealth can mean different things to different people. But the most important thing is that wealth is all about the acquisition mm -hmm. and the understanding that I have valuable assets at my disposal that I can use. So for someone who thinks that wealth is materialistic, you would end up seeing those people uh, trying to show off. Uh, they need to have a lot of money in their accounts. 
They need to have a lot of uh, luxury cars. They see a lot in real estate, a bit of show off. Such people is still really good for them. That is still worth for them. To another person, if they gain all that money and they don't have that independence, so independence, we're talking about financial independence, uh, location independence, time independence. If they still get all the money and they don't have the freedom to do what they want to do, they still feel they are poor. So for some people, wealth will mean the ability to travel the world, be any part of the world, have that geographical independence where they don't have to be stuck to Kumase or Accra or Washington or Joe Beg or any place. They can be anywhere and still earn their money. For some people, it's about social status. And I like to use the example of that drag log that was uh, in uh, Colombia. And after he made all the money, had even money stashed on the ground in wars and everything, he still wanted to be the president. And when he could not make it, that is when he went rogue and then began to do even worse things, bombing planes and stuff. So some people, no matter how much money they gain, if they are not regarded in society, if they are not revered, they are not respected, they are not honored, they still don't feel worthy enough. So wealth should not be something that anybody should limit anybody about. Some people's psychological inner peace. I have a colleague that we used to work in the bank who decided that uh, for the stress in the bank, she'd want to quit and then go and just open a shop and, and work at the shop. The reason was that she wanted to have that peace of mind where she would, her health was so important to her. So to some people, health is worth. Okay. And for that reason, they don't want to sacrifice their health for that worth. Okay. So I don't want anybody to limit anybody in the definition of worth. So in, for example, what I, I teach people when I talk about worth is that you need to define your own worth. Okay. Let's assume that right now I came here today and I give you a rock. And you have nothing, no knowledge about geology, nothing about mining. And it's actually gold. Because you do not know how gold looks in the raw state, you might throw it away. So the thing about wealth is that until you have your definition right, what are you actually chasing? So until people define what wealth is to them and they understand what it means to them, not from external validation, not from what people think, but what wealth is to you, that is when we begin to talk about wealth. Wow. So what it means basically is that we have to really sit down as individuals, leaders, team members, to define what wealth means to us. Exactly. Before we can proceed. That, that's even the starting point. The starting point. Yes. Okay. And there are so many paths we'll go to it, how we'll get you there, but until you define. So for example, if I don't know where I'm going, how would I know when I arrive? Right. So I, I am excited because uh, mostly we all, largely speaking, when we talk about wealth, everybody's mind goes straight to uh, money. Yeah, so we, I am extremely excited that you have clarified to us that when we talk about wealth, we are not talking mainly about one singular thing. Mm. It's a whole gamut of Sadly. things that we're Sadly. talking about. Sadly. So that's, um, so now, for, for teams and leaders, to understand that wealth is not just about finance. It's also about people's peace of mind. It's mm -hmm. also about people's, you know, well-being well -being. and as well. What will be your key submission when it comes to leaders' focus on wealth creation? I think the, the best way, Ghanaian, we like to talk about the economy, we talk about politics, mm -hmm. we talk about everything. And mm -hmm. Sometimes when you put things in perspective, it helps the viewers to actually understand it from that angle. Yeah. Let's pick our country, Ghana, for example. Ghana as a country, we are blessed with a lot of natural resources. We have gold, manganese, we have oil, and now we are talking about lithium. There's a lot of resources that as a country, not just Ghana, most African countries, we are blessed with. But the problem has always not been about having just that valuable asset. Mm -hmm. It is about two things. Is a valuable asset having extra value being added to it? And does it become valuable the more over time? Two things. Let's pick cashew. If we export cashew in its raw state, we are going for maybe, let's say, $7. The very moment we have a semi-processed, semi-processed cashew, it moves to about $15. So the very thing is that the very moment we add a little value to the resource we have, the value of that 
asset of that resource is actually increased automatically. So as a nation and as leaders, Mm -hmm. having enough resources, having all of these things at our disposal is not enough. Mm -hmm. It's about what we call optimization of what we have. So optimization is in two ways. We are looking at cost on one side and we are looking at productivity on one side. How can we get the best out of what we have? Gold, how do we get the best out of it? How do I reduce the cost component of it? And it's the same thing that happens even in economy and the economics as a country. Okay, Be- before you, I know when it comes to the national economic uh, discourse, it's, it's a whole lot. Yes. We will get back to that, but I want us to zero in on teams. You know, teams are the workplace, workplace teams and all within that. the communities, the kind of things that leaders mm. can focus on to create wealth. So before we, we touch on the... The, the first the, thing the, that I've said, and I, I think I keep telling people, the biggest, biggest wealth asset we have is the human beings. The human okay. beings are the most important resource that we have. If we as leaders would understand this right from the beginning, you cannot do everything by yourself. Mm-hmm. So you need to trust your team, mm-hmm. build your team, help them to become better, so that when you are not there, they can do it. So first, in leadership and about worth, mm-hmm. it starts first and foremost by vision. Okay. The same way we talked about definition of worth, mm-hmm. As a leader, if the people do not know exactly where they are going with you, mm-hmm. they, would, they would always throw and they would they'll miss it. Yeah. So you need to be very clear, clearly defined vision for them. Okay. In that vision, you state emphatically the mission. So I always tell people that vision is more like where we want to be, uh, how we see ourselves in 10 years. But mission is all about why did we even start this business? Why do we exist? How do we achieve this vision? So whereas in vision we are looking at what and where, in mission we are looking at how and why. Mm-hmm. And for this reason, when the people understand it so well, when the leader is even not there, the job will still continue. Mm-hmm. The problem we have in our the teams and a lot of businesses today is that there is a lot of micromanagement. Micromanagement in the sense that we employ people want to know what they are doing on their social media, mm-hmm. want to know what they are doing on their phones, want to know the tax that they are doing. The first most important thing is that you had a group of people you recruited from and you chose that person. So what it means is that you did the short listing, you interviewed them, and you took that employee out of the lot. For that reason, you trusted the person's capacity. Trust is an important component of wealth creation at the workplace. When people feel you believe in them, you trust them, and you give them that room, they are willing to even go the extra mile. They may make mistakes, but that is progress because it's called growth environment. Mm -hmm. It's the environment in which people are willing to share their ideas. Mm -hmm. They are willing to bring up new ideas. It will surprise you that these same workers will be the ones to bring you the next deal, the next contract. And if you can trust them, if you can actually give them that room, to become better of themselves, it goes for you. There's this thing that I tell people. There is the internal customer and there's the external customer. The external customer, we focus on them. But if you take care of your employees, then they will take care of your customers. If you don't take good care of your internal customers, your external customers will be in trouble. So when leaders sit to discuss about wealth creation, the focus should be value addition to their team members. 100%. It's either we are adding value mm-hmm. or we are becoming more valuable. More valuable. Okay. That is well said. Now, somebody asked a question. If all these team members have value to offer, why they need to add value? Yeah, that is good. So there is this thing that I keep telling people. If you have gold and you leave it there, you leave it gold, you leave it, you don't do anything to it. Because it's a scarce commodity, with time, it would appreciate. With time. But if you exploit all the options available and then you have that gold, it can bring you money now and you can use it now for something else tomorrow. 
When your team is already producing value, remember one particular thing. Optimization simply means that bringing the best out of them. So you can get the best out of them today, but can you get the best out of them every single day? Somebody's having marital issues. Somebody has lost a father. Somebody has lost a child. Things are happening in their lives. Some people are having drug addiction. A lot of issues. How do you ensure that the valuable person you have today will keep on giving? It is a gift that keep giving that will make the business actually rich. Yeah. So let's pick the case of Messi and Ronaldo. And let's pick the likes of uh, Adriano or Neymar in football and stuff. People with so much potential, but they are short-lived. Because at the end of the day, the value was there, but they did not have the consistency, the discipline, the effort to put it in. I always tell people that there is nothing wrong with vulnerability. When your staff know that they can be vulnerable, they can make mistakes, yet their mistakes, if it is within the confines of what has been described in their job, is acceptable, you allow more room for growth. So value here is where you give them more space, mm -hmm. trust them more, mm -hmm. delegate more, mm -hmm. don't, ex don't try to micromanage them too much. Once they're on board, give them that room to perform and ensure that you recognize their efforts. The problem is that most people are quick to punish. They are quick to scold. They are quick to tell you you're wrong. But a few people would want to give a compliment. Give them their due, mm -hmm. their bonuses, whatever is due them, and trust them more. Let them understand that if we get A, you get that. It's transactional leadership, but at the same time, it becomes transformative. And then it becomes, at the end of the day, something that transforms the entire business and the institution. They come good up. Oh, so far, so good. Yeah. Um, let's now go back to our, where we left off the national economic mm. wealth creation space where you were already touching mm. on how we could transform the resources we have, value mm. addition, optimization and all that. So getting back there, I have found something on the pages of a newspaper in Nigeria okay. called The Tribune. And okay. I want to read it to you all before I follow up with the question. I said the quantum of wealth available in a society is tied to the quality of its leadership. Mm -hmm. When a nation is poor, it is because its leaders have domiciled poverty in their mind and cannot convert opportunities to wealth. When a society is stagnated, it is because its leaders have shut their minds and cannot identify opportunities. When a company or country is backward, it is because its leaders are unprogressive. So rather than working on improving the future, they romanticize the past and celebrate the moment, failing in the process to take their people to the next level. <laughs> That's a deep one. And it's actually factual. Mm -hmm. So in Africa, for example, instead of we becoming opportunity seeking, we end up looking at the small milestones and we we'll, we'll blow it out of proportion. It becomes something that we exaggerate about. The thing is that opportunity seeking, number one, is information seeking. Mm -hmm. So our leaders should be well informed. Our leaders should be updated with what is happening, trends, things happening around them. The second thing is opportunity simply means, opportunity is a very simple uh, concept to understand. What is there that I, as a person, can do in order to harness the potential that I have. So it is just an avenue, it is just an occasion, it is just a chance, an eventuality that can bring a better or benefit to me. Basically just that. So now let's see as a country, Ghana. Mm -hmm. If you read Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, mm -hmm. and if you look at what a small country, and I say small country like England, mm -hmm. was able to do because England, the United Kingdom, for example, Texas and the US, is bigger than the entire United Kingdom. But yet they were able to rule almost all the world. How did they do that? They discovered that in real sense, the wealth of a nation is not only dependent on what the country produces. Mm -hmm. No, it's not just that. 
what the country is able to make other people depend on them for. You see, the concept of dependency is very powerful. If I, as a country, and let me speak I like Ghana, if Ghana decides, we are surrounded by other African countries, is there a need in West Africa that Ghana as a country can pioneer, champion, when it comes to cotton, Ghana is the place to go. When it comes to, and Benin has done that, by the way, just recently. When it comes to cocoa, we will be the champions. We will be the ones to lead at the forefront. Do we want to lead like something like digitalization? And these are powerful because there is something that we call diaspora bonds. These are a bit technical in terms of finance. That people like Pakistan, India, and Israel were able to use to make them worthy over time. Now, what, what, how is this possible? Pick a, a case like Pakistan and India. They saw the digital age, and then they saw technology. And they said, you know something? We would want to position ourselves in a way that whenever anybody needs skilled labor in this area, we'll be there. Mm-hmm. We're here when NIT came. We're here when IPMC came, came from India. And they championed this course. Today, as we talk, almost in almost all parts of America and greater parts of the world, when people are looking for cheaper labor, yet skilled for IT-related jobs, they go to India, they go to Pakistan. What is Ghana going to do? Because there's a whole thing. The first level is self-sufficiency. As a country, we should be able to eat where we grow, where, where we produce. It's basic, simple economics. If we depend too much on other people for everything, and I'm a Christian, so I like sometimes quoting if I'm allowed, the Bible says that the borrower is a slave to the lender, and the rich would always rule over the poor. When you depend on other people too much, then they dictate for you. What has Switzerland got to do with cocoa? Yet they have so much stock of cocoa, so much that it can determine prices. And the moment Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire came together, we started dictating the pricing on the global markets. So we need to get to that point where, number one, we are self-sufficient. But number two is to identify the needs in society. And when I'm saying society, outside of even Ghana, yeah. that we can champion. It will bring us forex. In economics, we call it balance of payments. We are looking at the imports. We are looking at the exports. We are looking at the difference in between these two, the gaps. So what happens is that if we are able to export more than we import, then we're already making amends to our forex. And the foreign exchange issue, we are solving it gradually. So as a country, we should look at what are some of the things. And I, the good thing is that Ghana's biggest resource is not our oil. It's not our gold. It's a human capital. Recently, some people had a debate and were saying, oh, there's a lot of brain drain, a lot of people leaving Ghana and everything. I said, you are missing the bigger picture. It means that Ghana is producing quality people that they are able to fit into the other parts of the world, which means that if we have an exodus of people leaving and they go and they train and they expose and we build a better country and they come, it will be a value addition to us. We shouldn't look at it like it's just a brain drain. All those abroad, most of them we speak, I travel, we meet them. They would like to be home. If there's something good and tangible that they can come back home to, to bring all the experience, their network back home. So what we should do is that if people are leaving, let them go. But I advise young people who want to travel, and I'm, I'm, I'm digressing here because it's important. They shouldn't travel for menial jobs. They should travel for school, travel for career progression, travel for more experience, value-adding things. So that in 10 years' time, when they come to Ghana, they can become the campaigns and also dictate things and help our country to move on. Uh, Dr. Dia, you, you've actually touched on quite a lot of things. Um, I want to specifically ask, so leaders across board, whether within the academia, with industry, politics, every, everywhere, what are some of the strategies that we need to focus on, you know, within the industry space, within the academic space, and within the national or the national I, 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 I will sum up everything down to productivity, in everything that I'll say, down to productivity. And I'll explain this in simple terms. Yeah. Let's assume that Ghana has a budget deficit. Let's assume. 
Budget deficit will simply means that in terms of revenue, we have less revenue than our expenditure. We have more expenditure than our revenue. And we have a deficit. There are three options in economics we can use. So the first one is to increase productivity so that we get more revenue to match that mm -hmm. expenditure. Okay. Or we go for austerity measures, which means that we reduce the expenditure. Mm -hmm. So that's when you see that uh, there's, there's maybe uh, a ban on recruitment. Okay. They are not doing okay. projects and stuff. So that we reduce the expenditure. Mm -hmm. Or we go for taxation. Okay, and then we we'll go for that. Taxes and then austerity measures. Okay, I, I, I want us to... To break it down okay. so that our cherished viewers Ooh, can understand appreciate it. it. Okay, I, I, because I'm, I think you are getting to your technical, <laughs> technical element. So I beg your pardon. Just to, to go break easy it down. on us. Yes. yes. Um, so productivity. Whether we are being productive enough or not boils down to these three areas. Academia, industry, and politics or political authority. So I want us to take it from the academic or academia. Mm. How can we, leaders within that space, create wealth by being productive? I had the privilege to uh, do a program with the University of Pennsylvania, Wharton, and I had the privilege to learn recently last year with Kellogg School of Management. I was so surprised to see that the lecturers of all these programs were at least having 10 startups, board, advisory board, whatever, that they were part of. So aside the academia, mm -hmm. they were co-founder, a shareholder, mm -hmm. a director, an advisory board member in a very productive venture. So in as much as they were... Teaching. Academic. Academic. They, were they were also, also industry-oriented. So they bring that exactly. industry experience to bear. Exactly. In okay. fact, in Kellogg, they have what are called clinical professors. Okay. People who have done so much in the industry, mm -hmm. who are now bringing their expertise and knowledge to academia. So these people don't go through the mill like professors who are just from school and field PhD and then they're professors. They are people from industry. And then they bring their industry expertise and have contributed so much to knowledge and industry mm -hmm. that when they join, mm -hmm. they see them as clinical professors. Actually, it started with medicine and so on. Okay. And eventually, these people come on board and they impact so much knowledge. So are you by that suggesting that in our space, we should be looking at that kind of approach? Where what, the what, what, is the, what, what is the end game mm -hmm. of what we learn at school? The end game of what we learn at school is to become skillful, okay. is to produce value, mm -hmm. is to deliver value. Mm -hmm. So if I go to school and I learn, and I cannot be productive, I cannot deliver any value, I cannot be skillful in anything, then I've missed it. Okay. So we need to teach right from the beginning, from the first year, second year, third year. And it's one of the reasons why I moved from industry to academia. Okay. And those I teach are as practical as possible. I mentor young people every year. I mentor minimum 100 young people. I mentor professionals. I do everything. The reason that I do is that no matter the certificates we have, if we do not become skillful and experts in our given areas, what do we deliver? What do we give? Okay, you have someone who is a PhD in whatever and cannot even, at the end of the day, produce one paragraph, how is that possible? Because it's like we've become mechanical and we are okay. just like getting and getting and getting. Einstein says we should stop about getting and moving to becoming people of value. value. The reason why it is important we become people of value is because we become dispensers of value. In wealth, you can never be worthy without delivering value. And I told you from the beginning, exactly. you either delivering value, or you are becoming valuable. And that is the whole thing. All right. You are either <laughs> becoming valuable or, or you, you are, are delivering, delivering value. value. On that note, let's take our first break and we shall be right back. Mm -hmm. 
Are you looking for an excellent professional risk management and training solutions provider? Look no further. Your ultimate solution provider is here at V5 Solutions Limited. We support you with our professional skills in building capacity of your teams and managing all your operational risks. Our best bespoke solutions include private and corporate security risk management and training, fraud investigation, occupational safety and health management and training, project monitoring, evaluation and research, supply of private security, logistics equipment. Our solutions are professionally delivered with in-depth focus on people, processes and procedures the environment and ultra modern technology contact us now on 0303-957136 and 053-5176615 or send us an email at info at v5solutionslimited.com for a partnership that strengthens your company for an excellent sustainable productivity and profitability visit our website at www.v5solutionslimited.com for more details v5 solutions limited your ultimate professional risk management and training hub. Welcome back, cherished viewers and listeners. We are on Leadership 360. This is the final episode for 2023. We are excited that we have a very, you know, well-educated, well-rounded consultant with us to handle leadership and world creation, to, to just bring the cats into the years you know, program on leadership tricity. Dr. Evans Dia has been telling us a lot about wealth creation, where he told us about wealth not defined in a straitjacket. It means a lot to different people. And he has also mentioned about the, the human capital being the key resource that can be used to create wealth across all societies, nations, and the continents at large that our focus should not be only on the natural resources that we have, but the human capital is the key to all of this. Indeed, that is why we say leadership is the denominator of all human endeavors, regardless of whatever resource you have. So before we went on the break, he was talking about the academia, what value they can add by, bring, by being, bringing knowledge from industry to bear on whatever they teach. Mm. Doc, before you quickly, I come back to you to pass quick comments on industry value addition mm. towards wealth creation, as well as uh, political space. Let me quickly announce the phone lines so mm. our viewers, cherry viewers can also participate. The, our phone lines are still 0531-982298, 0531-982298. If you are outside the shores of Ghana, just add plus 233 three, and you'll get through to us. You can equally send a WhatsApp text and we shall read it here on the program. The program is still Leadership 360. So back to you, Doc. Mm. Your comments on industry value addition or value creation towards world creation. So recently I was reading this from, um, I think, uh, Daily Graphic, um, mm -hmm. somewhere in the 60s. Did you know that Ghana used to produce yachts, boats? That's news to me. Yes. So Ghana, Ghana was actually producing yacht and boats, and we actually exported from Ghana to the United States. The fact of the matter is that industrialization would always be the bedrock mm -hmm. for productivity. Yeah. Projects and ideas about we having businesses set up manufacturing centers, uh, startups, entrepreneurship, it is actually the way to grow as a country. So the number one thing that as a country and industry, so I'll look at the country first and the industry second, a country should create that enabling environment for businesses to flourish. Okay. 
That's the first most important thing. Let's become the place where everybody wants to come and work. And that's what Dubai did. Create that enabling environment. Whoever you are, come, be here, have fun, have everything, and just do your work. If you do it, wherever you are receiving the money stays in the country before you take it out. So let's create that enabling environment first for our local businesses to flourish. So it means that the political authority, I guess here you are fusing the two, where the political authorities must work closely hand in with, hand, hand, in hand with, with the industry, industry exactly. to create that exactly. enabling environment. I, I, I don't see why Casa Precon should not be taken all over Africa. I don't see why Adonko should not be taken all over Africa, India or whatever. We are blessed with certain great businesses thriving in Ghana, A, A1 Bread and so on. And they were able to move to the United States to start. We have this uh, chocolate, uh, Nish chocolate. Mm -hmm. They started here and recently started also in the United States. We should just keep encouraging and our governments are doing their best, but we just ask them to do more. And then industry also should now to start to look beyond what governments can do and also what they can also do themselves. Mm -hmm. The government should also come in to help. So it's, it's actually hand in hand. Okay. The industry can't do it without the government. The government can't achieve it without the, industry. without the industry. Even if you create the enabling environment and nobody's taking the, uh, the funds, the benefits, nothing, nothing happens. happens. So industry should look at problems, mm -hmm. just problem solving, simple problem solving, and look at going beyond Ghana. Look at our fellow people, Nigerians. And what they've done with their music industry is a diaspora of people mm -hmm. that actually moved a lot of things around the world. Mm -hmm. So Ghanaians in the diaspora who are already there should also think that eventually, though they are there, they love Ghana so much. What can they also do back home? What can they also do to help the country? And some of these ideas would all get there eventually. That's great. We all need to collaborate. Mm -hmm. Industry, Government, government, diaspora, everybody, everybody needs to be on board. collaborate to better the lot of our mm. society. Now, we are at the tail end of 2023. We are moving into 2024. Mm -hmm. As a, fin a chartered financial economist, you have written a book, mm -hmm. Intentional Wealth 2.0, 2.0, Building yeah. with the Pentagon Wealth Model. I would love that you dole out some ideas mm. to all of us as leaders and team members within our societies, our communities, our organizations, and our country and continent as large, moving into 2024. What kind of financial model or modeling that we can use to create wealth for our teams, organizations, and our countries as well? When people get the chance to read my book, <clears throat> they will get to know about the Pentagon Wealth Model. So I wouldn't go there. Okay. They would even get to know about some of, I have a formula for creation of wealth. They'll get to know that. I give them five key elements that they'll be able to use to create wealth. But the first statement I want to make here is that wealth is not for the selected few. Okay. Wealth is not something for only some people in society. Wealth is possible for every one of us. And wealth is not happening by chance. It is intentionally built over a period. Okay. This generation is a generation where we want everything quick. We are used to fast food, we are used to fast internet, fast whatever, fast everything. So we expect wealth to be fast. There's a fast lane, there's a slow lane. But I want to tell most people listening that slow success built character and it is because it helps you to go through the process I have failed at so many things I've succeeded at so many things and that is the reason why I know how it feels for someone not to have and how it feels to be down so that when I'm up I understand them better it creates empathy because we all become vulnerable we understand that okay I'm not some untouchable superman whatever mm -hmm. So the first thing I need everybody to understand is that time is your most valuable asset as a person. Time, time is your most valuable. The reason why it's the most valuable is that you cannot add more. You cannot replenish it. Time lost is lost. So today, the 25th of December, 2023, is gone forever and ever. We would never have it. We would never see it. So no matter how rich you are, you cannot add to time. You mm -hmm. cannot. You can only become more productive 
in time. time. So you have to first and foremost take out the time wasters in your life. Anything that is not bringing you anything close to your worth, cut it off. Most people think that they are, they are people that are, are not focused in life. But in fact, they are just distracted. Okay. No, just yeah. hold it. We okay. have a first call on the line. Mensa okay. from Ashoman. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mensa from Ashoman. Oh, I guess we have lost Mensa. No, please continue. Okay. So the good thing here is that for most people, they think that they are not focused in life, but they are just distracted. So your time, first look for the time wasters in your life. Take them out. And then if there are any technology means you can leverage to become more productive, you become productive. Recently, I was sharing this about artificial intelligence to people. Mm-hmm. There was a work I was supposed to do in seven days. I ended up doing it something around seven hours. The reason is that artificial intelligence and other technologies are easing and making life better for all of us. So what you can do is that, number one, you can go for financial leverage. Financial mm-hmm. leverage which simply means Understanding the use of debt is important. Understanding the use of financial opportunities around you is important. You can go for system leverage. What opportunities do you have being a Ghanaian? There are programs at maybe NEIP, programs at Ghana Enterprise Agency, program at Ghana Investment Boom. What opportunities do we have? There is APSA having this, Societe General having this, that, that. What can you get from there? There could be marketing leverage that you can have. Why do you have to build your own platform when other people have already built a platform? Like you're having me here. All right. <laughs> Good afternoon, Idrisu. Good afternoon. Welcome to Leadership 360. Yeah, it's a privilege having Doc sharing his classical impact and knowledge about leadership. And I want to ask a question. Okay, please go ahead. Please, you talk about time with this. And I want to ask that, how will you identify time wasted in, in your midst in terms of sometimes you have friends that you have, you have friends and colleagues that you are with. How will you identify that this person is just wasting my time so that I can distance myself from them? And sometimes it can also be like selfishness, like you don't want to, it's like you, you know all, like the friends that you have around you because you think like uh, what you need or where you want to reach because of their attitude or where they also have their vision onto, it is not tied with yours. So you want to separate yourself from them. But it will feel like you are selfish and you only want things for yourself. So how will you distance yourself and do not feel like you are selfish? No. Okay. Where 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 did you call from? Adrian? I'm calling from here the OT region. All right. Thank you very much for the question. Doc, Idrisu is asking, how do I identify the time wasters and how do I distance myself? So it's, it's, it's very simple. First one is about your purpose, about your goal, okay. your mission, your target. Is this person helping me to achieve it? Mm-hmm. Is this person facilitating it? Is this person accelerating it? What is the person's contribution towards my goal? If there is nothing in all of this, then the person can be someone you should be nice to. I tell people, be nice to everybody as much as possible. Speak nice of them. Be gentle. But when it comes to work and mm-hmm. work and work, there should be people who are adding value, value. Okay. or helping accelerate it. Thank you. Uh, Muntaka from Newtown. Good afternoon. Good yeah, afternoon. Morning. Welcome to Leadership Resistance. Thank you. First of all, I would like to give my suggestion on this particular program. Okay. This is the first time I actually come across it because most often than not, most of us are not doing at this time. So if you could get a podcast where we could be taking the audio, you know, either on the go or later we listen to it, I think you do us a lot of good. All right. It will be all of it well. um, my main concern actually is not about the human resource because yes, Trust me, Ghanaians, we, we, we have a lot of human resources. A lot of people have identified their potentials. But how to materialize it is the issue. 
you would you you would do heaven and earth you go everywhere and nobody's ready to give you startup capital and not even the minimum amount to start something with you hear some people saying to go to friends and family hey you're surrounded by friends and family who don't have like you what you gonna do the banks are not being innovative enough the financial institutions are not being innovative enough for from my perspective, all I was expecting somebody to, to, to do is just like some of the NGOs or stuff like that have done. When someone comes to you wanting to start up a business or wanting to start up something, at least look at what he's doing, take him through some interview and know his leverage, where he's got into, how deep he's done his own investigation or his own background check about whatever he's going to get into. If you think he needs more support because the zeal is there, Get him through some education or some practice, some practical experience. I mean, let him undertake somebody. Give him about three to five, six months. He's learned hard. Get somebody to join him up. Let him know he, that person is your representation. So that the person is going to be like a watchman to him, checking out all the things he's doing and helping him with things. When he gets to his level and he's already paid all the money back, then you can let him go. You can even still give him some coaching for a while before letting him go. But hey, it doesn't happen like that in Ghana. Right. It's something else. You find leadership. You go to a family, you know this is the leader because he's got everything in the head. Please. But because he's not financially stable, forget it. Nobody sees him as one. Hello, Buntaka. Yes, sir. Very great points you are making. But quickly sum it up for us so that other colleagues can also come on board. In summary, I'm looking at us, my boss on there. I'm so, so moved by everything he's saying. So, you know, eventually it's because... I have been caught in the hospital. That's why I, I've had the opportunity to watch you live, and I'm so happy. And I wanted to come in here and go. But what I'm saying is that, much as there is, we need to identify the human resource. Trust me, the most thing that is eaten us up is the financial resource. That's the main thing. So if we could also find a time and within this leadership seminar, whatever it is, get people to come and give us typical, practical advice on financial welfare, and then also how. Talk to the big men, I mean, the, those, the, the powers that be, so that they can also get on board and help oh, us out. I think you right. do us a lot of good. Thank oh, you very much. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Muntaka. I must say that since we started the Leadership 360 program on Metro TV, we have dealt with a lot of topics that, you know, underpins most of the things that you are saying. We have also organized some out-of-studio program just to educate our cherished viewers and our entire populace on some of these issues. So look out for this space and more will come in 2024. Meanwhile, most of the programs we have, their episodes, you can find them on YouTube or even on Facebook. When you type Leadership 360, you find and you listen to those ones. Doc, time is almost yes. against so, us. So you were speaking just on... Just to give a, yeah, quick, just a point quick one on, on what he said. So, this is a thing about raising capital in that part of our world. You know, in the other parts, so we have what called private equity. We have venture capitalists okay. and so on and so forth, family offices and, and stuff. We've not developed them so well that in our part, we only go directly yeah. to the banks. Yeah. But there are other schemes mm -hmm. that I think if we can develop, mm -hmm. that would really help us. Okay. Myself. I'm looking at some of these models mm -hmm. uh, with other people that we mm -hmm. can look at 2025 that we can come up okay. with. If you pick the cooperative system that mm -hmm. happens even yeah. in Ghana, yeah. people come together, they contribute. And I realize so many people don't know. If you, believe, if you belong to any cooperative and you contribute to a certain level, you're able to take three times the amount you have contributed. That becomes an instant form of capital for that person. Okay, Doc, okay, um, cool. you were talking about time wasters yes. and other things, but I guess at this point, I will plead that cherished viewers will follow you on Facebook okay. to learn more, and all your social media handles is Dr. Ivan's Dia, and you'll get more of these tips from mm. him. And you can ask all the questions mm. that is bothering your mind, and Dr. Dia will be ready and willing to attend to you or address mm. those questions. But... One of the key things also on this program that we hold so dear to our hearts is a leadership, um, what we call honor code. Mm. We believe that if all of us subscribe to that honor code, what, in whatever field we find ourselves, we should be able mm. to 
better than a lot of our society, our organizations, mm. and our country. So let's take a quick look at or listen to our honor code, and we shall be right back. proud and firm African. I will take a stand. I will lead and be the change. Come and take my hand. For the safety, honor, and welfare of my country and company come first. Always and every time. The honor, welfare, and comfort of the people I lead come next. My own ease, comfort, and safety come last, always and every time. Welcome back, cherished viewers and listeners. This is the Leadership 360 show. We're just about wrapping up. Dr. Ivan Zia is our guest. Mm -hmm. Doc, your last words in so, a minute. I think my last words will be my heptagon wealth model in my book, which people can just read it. But basically what I say is that time is your most valuable asset. Mm -hmm. Work with it. Mm -hmm. And then to create value. Yeah. When you create the value, the income that it generates, try to save a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. But savings is not enough to make enough okay. worth. So you have to invest it. Mm -hmm. And when you invest it, that is when you begin to get surplus. Mm -hmm. And that is where, when you get to the point where you are earning money whilst you are sleeping, that is where you are becoming worthy. Thank you very much. Where can we get the book? Uh, so for now, uh, you can get it on my website, Kingdom Bookshop in Accra and Kumase. Okay. But if you just go to evansdia.com, you request for it wherever you are, we deliver it to you. Thank just evansdia.com. Thank you, Doc, for, for, for all the, the submissions you have Thank made. You so Cherished viewers, all too soon, we have come to the end of the program. But not without me paying growing tribute to all the guests who have appeared on this show. Dr. Genevieve, Dr. Ajiman, Mr. Mark, Obinya Peru, Ama Amwa, uh, Na Chuchu, Soyo the First, um, Farouk Kailan, and all the people who have passed through this program. We are so, so grateful. Use the opportunity to also wish all of us a very prosperous new year 2024. It is our fervent prayer as Leadership Tricity team that next year we shall get better and better and we shall learn a lot while we relearn and unlearn so as to better the lot of our society. It's been great having you on this program all through the eight month period. Hope to see you next year.